Yelly Taylor. <laughs> Getting started already, Laura Payton. Yes. Oh my God. Um, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I'm so happy to be talking with you on StoryCorps. Um, so let me just ask you a question and then you ask me the same question. Okay. Okay. How did you meet me? <laughs> I met you in another realm lifetimes ago. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that's the most accurate. <laughs> that's the most accurate way to describe that. Truly. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know the particular circumstances of that life, but um or those lives. But in this life, in the physical realm, we met because of hard space and you were invited by Gabriel or someone and they said, there's going to be this new person that you don't know. <laughs> okay. And I was like, oh, anxiety, anxiety. I don't know this person's energy. We shall see. And then I met you and I said, mm -mm -mm. I've known you for lifetimes. Nice to see you again. <laughs> that's, so, that's so true. I mean, truly, that's like the best description of how we met, because as soon as I jumped on that space, I was like, is, is this family? Is this what family is? <laughs> um, I don't even, it's so funny, because I don't even remember it. I don't remember meeting you. At all. It's like, haven't. I just always known you and perhaps like there was the first time that you got on the call, but I don't even remember that because it's like, did they exist before you were on? I don't know. So. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't remember. You know, it's funny because there's, you know, people say you'll never remember what you did for somebody, but you'll always remember how they made you feel. Mm. And this, this is just that. It's like from the moment I hopped on that space, I left being like, Okay, so I'm now. This is this is a new part part of my life now. Um, I will be meeting with this woman all the time. We're gonna become the best of friends because we already are. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I do um, declare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, and Heart Space really became this place for Black people to just be Black people on the space and and we all shared that kind of artist forward mentality or experience. But at the end of the day, we were just black folk coming together to just share. And that was not something that I had really experienced before in that way. You know, I'm used to kind of having it with a few people here and there but to come on to a Zoom space in the middle of a pandemic where we're all stressed and worried and afraid and you know angry and frustrated, all of these different things to see all of these beautiful black faces being real about that and you being the facilitator, I was like, okay, well, this woman is, must have been the moon to my sun or the sun to my moon or the stars to my moon. I mean, something. So thank you for having that space and for being the leader that you are. Truly, you are one of a kind and you don't know this, but I talk about you all the time. <laughs> Stop. Literally all the time. Literally. <laughs> you know, I appreciate all of that. And also, I think it's just such confirmation because before HeartSpace started, I would not have imagined myself to be the most um, social mm. person. Um, 
and not not social isn't the right word. So if I think of it, I'll share it. But the vision of heart space was definitely given to me. And it was one of those things of, okay, this is this thought, I know this thought isn't originating with me because it's so beyond what I feel like I do mm -hmm. um, or how I see myself in connection with others. And so it was that the idea of heart space sat with me for months because I was just like, I don't think, I don't think it's me. I, I don't mm -hmm. think, I don't know. I think it would be a good idea for somebody else to do. And, you know, it sat for so long. I was like, all right, all right. I will just send out this email. I don't even like Zoom. I don't even know how to people like that, but we will see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so for me, you know, the confirmation of, of what happens um, when we both listen to those um, deep callings, Mm -hmm. And also the confirmation of the transformation that is invited when we listen to each other. Mm. That I think there's this kind of taking for granted of listening because we often listen to the people that we know. Wow. Um, and it can be this kind of passive experience. But I think what's so powerful about hard space was that most of the people didn't know each other very well. Right um or at all right and that there was this arriving in that space with the intent to listen deeply and openly mm. which um really i don't think i had seen anything like that no and not listening to respond not listening to object not listening to for any other reason just than just to receive and to hold um, people up to the best of our ability, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what we may have been experiencing in our own personal lives, which we often also shared and right. were held up in that. So yeah, I, I feel very honored that the call for that space was relentless yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know the like universal spiritual like do it do it do it do it because of course i needed it yeah so i don't i don't know how i got on that particular train of thought but no that i mean that's absolutely beautiful and true even from just my experience i feel like it, you know, I said earlier that you were facilitating it, but in actuality, there was no real facilitation that happened on there. And I think that was the beautiful thing about it was that we all showed up when we could, you know, and it was, how you doing? And from how you doing, we went into <laughs> conversations about, I mean, the range <laughs> of conversations and the depth of conversations and the way that we were able to, and I mean, I'll, I'll use I statements, a phrase from us. <laughs> um, in the way that some of these conversations changed me, really, um, from thinking about the headlights <laughs> to, I mean, every there are so many different things that we talked about that are just now engraved on my mind that I will keep with me and that I talk to every other person about. So the call being relentless was necessary because somewhere, somewhere, somehow, um, there was something that said, hey, there's a La Rob that needs this as well. So you really got to do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, really a beautiful space. And to see you, I mean, from knowing the this much about you, you know, when we started Heart Space to now feeling like, okay, this is a partner. I'm like, who? I, I feel like I, I am everything that this woman is and I want what this woman wants. Like what, how are we, how did it get so, 
tight, but I would not trade it for anything. And I'm just so proud of you. And you're going to do amazing things still. You, really, you already are out here doing everything under the moon and killing at it. So I'm receiving what you're saying. And I'm also just imagining you saying that last string of words and saying, I. Ooh. You want you want to try that? Just everything that you shared, because we we do mirror each other, and it's so mm. easy to see, you know, it as a window, uh -huh. a mirror. And so go ahead, and just say the last bit. You know, I am doing pretty much everything under the sun and the moon, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm out here. I'm killing it. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I really feel that way. And to be, you know, I'm grateful because I see more clearly what I am capable of doing um, differently than last year at this time. Last year at this time, I feel like I was very confused and a little bit worried that there was no you know, July, 2021, LaRob. Hmm. And here I am, July, 2021, being like, oh, there's a July, 2031, LaRob. Yes. And that's just such a different, a different place to be in, even with all of the chaos that is still happening and things not being exactly where I want them to be. I have so much more of a trajectory hmm. than I did last year. And I'm very, very grateful for that and for the people and the things that have been placed in my life over this last year that have helped me to become more clear about that. Mm -hmm. So I I mean, I am, I'm really doing the dang thing. Mm -hmm. And I do not take that lightly. When somebody asks me to speak on something, I do, mm -hmm. you know, whereas before it would have been a, oh, am I qualified? But even that word, for me has just kind of shifted and changed into this word that I don't really need to have because I am qualified and I've been qualified because of my experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, to be connected to a person who is, like you said, we mirror each other a lot in that we have such a personal journey of triumph and overcome. Um, that is easily reflected into our professional lives. Right. I mean, we, I feel like we take all of that and find somehow to be like, and professionally, I do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, okay, can you, as you know, like words, I'm very interested in words and the meaning yeah. of words and how things shift mm -hmm. when we get clear on what we're saying yeah what is professionally what do you mean professionally Ooh. Hmm. yes thank you um i think professionally maybe what i more specifically mean is the thing that makes us money okay mm -hmm. that's what i mean professionally because i to again the word qualification and professionally go hand in hand sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't want it to mean, you know, that the work that we do outside of the thing that makes us money disqualifies us in any sort of way mm -hmm. um, or that it's not professional. Mm -hmm. so thank you for, for catching that. See, this is, see, <laughs> this, is why, this is why we have these conversations. Um, so yes, I feel like we are consummate artists in every aspect of our lives, whether that's the making money portion, whether it's the interpersonal connection level, the familial, the friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm happy to be connected with you. Um, and to, to just even know your breadth of art making alone i mean can we can we talk about decomposed can we can we just have a moment to yeah. 
talk about how that came about and what that is to be as you see it, Miss Artistic Director. You know, it's very interesting when people talk about Decompose. Mm -hmm. I, I'm realizing because so much of it, I, I share this with our founder, Corey, all the time, so much of it feels surreal mm. that I, I'm always stunned, I think, when people talk about it. Mm. Also because so much of it happens not as you know, as an artist behind, I don't want to say behind closed doors, but you know that idea. So many of it, so much of it happens outside of the things that are publicly available. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and if that's 90% of the work and 90% of that work is emailing and conversations and all of that decomposed, it's to me can often feel like all of that stuff. Mm. And so when re people relate to me about it, in a way that it's the public facing. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> like, that, that's how other people, <laughs> that's how other people <laughs> receive it, you right. know? Like, um, but I think Decomposed has been such a teacher mm -hmm. for me. Um, and as much as we are guiding it, I think it's also guiding us. Mm. Um, when, Corey and I really met because of Decomposed. It was a, you know, an idea that she had and she we emailed and we've built it since. But to me, the constant, um, the constant request, hmm. I think that Decomposed has of us is an intention. Um, hmm. And alongside intention, I would say that it's um, deep, deepening love um, for ourselves and for the art form and for our community mm. and, and being relentless with finding ways to express that intention and that deep love um and to um and to refine our ability to tell the stories of ourselves right and yeah. so i think that in a way it's a it's an ensemble and it's an organization but it's also a process of healing right mm. what does it take to love yourself more and what are the things that you perhaps don't wish to see but are there mm -hmm. and what are the ways that we can acknowledge them and incorporate them and integrate them in order to share a fuller picture right. of who we are in sort of our divinity as people but also as a community and also as just like the creators mm -hmm. you know um, in the universe, I would say. You know, you you kind of touched on something and I just want to like get your thoughts as well about it. This thing about storytelling, I feel like is so natural to a lot of communities. Um, and I think for some reason we've well again speaking about myself i feel like i've come back to this idea of telling my story grounded in like truth and what i'm finding is that the spaces that i exist in outside of the confines of my home i want to be places that force me or ask me to tell my story truthfully as well and so when you mentioned that decomposed is, you know, what it frequently asks of you is to be authentic, to be introspective, to really kind of check yourself to be able to reflect that work outwardly really speaks to me. <laughs> and it's a, it, there's a lot of 
what I want to be doing in the art, in the art world that is just that is telling the most honest story through whatever, but being sure that people are able to connect to that honesty, to the raw truth um, of my story that may look different from your story um, and different from the audience's story. But it's definitely what I was drawn to about not only decomposed, but just you know, you and Corey, because I could really tell that that was important. That was like the the ground on which you all stood with the work that you do. It's not about coming in and being a professional. It's about coming in and being a storyteller. So, yeah. You know, you said something very interesting um, about wanting to be in spaces that uh, ask for your authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I often think about is what does it mean to be in spaces, to be in spaces or to create spaces that need your authenticity? Mm. Mm. You know what I mean? That it, that it, knows and understands that it doesn't function with that same kind of energy and essence without it. Right. Um, and I think it's very, what, what I'm struck by right now is the connection between that and heart space. Mm. Right, this idea of authenticity being the essential aspect right. of what allows the thing to flourish. Hmm. And I think, you know, maybe perhaps requesting is the first step. But but when I think about, I mean, if we, if we zoom out and talk about the world as it thinks about, you know, this catchphrase of diversity, equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. which, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. One thing <laughs> I really want to be the part of it is that you have to know that you need something. Yeah. You value it so differently when you know that you need it to be there. So in the way that we need people, that we want to be needed in our authentic selves, the way that I, I it's the way that I imagine the, the sort of culmination of this work is the understanding mm. that we are needed. Mm. Voices are needed and not just requested. Right. Like something ain't quite right mm. if this piece isn't here. So. Uh, you are so right. I mean, and, you know, since we're there, let's go, let's go. <laughs> in because, and me and you have talked about this before, but so frequently our society that is founded on this idea of whiteness and on supremacy strips people naked of themselves. Mm -hmm. And it creates, it, it like forms them into this box, this robot, if you will, that is just kind of going with the motions. And you're so right that if only people knew that we needed DEI, that we needed equity, that we needed in, you know diversity, it, one, it wouldn't be an afterthought. And two, we would the, the conversation would be much different than it is now because, like I like we said before, it seems like it's catchphrasy. It's an afterthought. It's a oh maybe we should do this mm -hmm. when for us it is who we are. Mm -hmm. It is our community. It is our upbringing, and so it's never an afterthought, and it's always what we bring. Mm -hmm. um, because we recognize how important it is to us from growing up and from our experiences, we understand the importance of community and that we need it. Mm -hmm. um, so the conversation is much different from, you know, between us and between those who are like, let's maybe think about diversity this time, mm -hmm. you know, 
Mm-hmm. So I think you just really hit the nail on the head by talking about this idea of understanding that you need something and how that changes your perspective on how to get it, how to keep it, um, and how to um, grow it and appreciate it as well. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think about, I mean, think about what your body does when it needs water, you know, the different things that your body will literally go through to tell you, I need hydration. Now, yeah. <laughs> your brain will not be able to function. <laughs> literally. Yes, all systems down. <laughs> and that it is no, it is truly no different when we're having this conversation about equity. Mm-hmm. It's no different. And too often people see it as this thing that we can just kind of be like, Oh, you know, we can have it on a Tuesday and a Friday and we should be good. No, you got to eat your veggies and drink water every day. Uh, You know, period. And I feel like it's the, it's, it's often thought of the icing on the cake as opposed to the cake. (laughs) That. Like what's icing with no cake? Like it's the actual cake. I don't know what the icing would be in this way, but (laughs) I, (laughs) I just think Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that when we we need each other simply put you know and and if we even expand outside of DEI and just keep keep, you know expanding this conversation I think about society and incarceration Mm. the idea that we don't need everyone that there wow. are people who there are people in the society who are who are afterthoughts hmm. who have to um have to atone in order to deserve space hmm. wow who exist in in these very fundamental ways um and so i think very recently i've been thinking about what it means to understand um, connectedness. Hmm. And I read something yesterday that said wounds happen in community and Hmm. therefore so does healing. Wow. Um, And so I've just been sort of taking in all the ways that things are requested and things are valued and things are needed and not loved and things are maybe loved and not needed and valued and not wanted, you know, and and looking at these different dynamics and trying to figure out what is the most important and what, what feels like it's balanced for Mm. me. Right. And, and I feel like it's in a society like ours that really thrives on separation Um, separation from ourselves, separation from the land that we're on, Mm. Um, separation from our history, separation from each other. In what ways does meditating and asking and and looking toward connectedness shift the ways that we can show up for ourselves and other people? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I really, all of that, <laughs> it's, that's, I don't have anything to say after that, honestly, because yes, truly, um, you're so right. I, I really feel like the society that we are in right now thrives off of separation. That's such an interesting way to put that. I mean, and thinking about, you know, as you were saying, like people who are incarcerated or people who are um, suffering from homelessness. To our society, these are disposable people. And, you know, and again, we can really kind of go outward and outward and outward to really find all the ways in which we separate ourselves from people Um, and I am a strong believer in connectedness, a strong 
believer of love and what that looks like in communities and how communities really are the, the epicenter of authentic love. Like, you know, I mean, it, it, we can get really deep. We really can. And, and I think, right. listen, okay. But like, you know, I say this all the time to people and I'm going to say it again to you because I've said this to you before, but like one of my favorite movies is Interstellar. <laughs> and there's a line in this movie and I promise I'm going to bring this all the way back around. But there's a line in this movie <clears throat> where, you know, Anne Hathaway, she says, we love people who are dead. And we, and, and, and that's all she says in the movie, but, but we love people who have died in the same way that we, in the same way, if not more than we love them when they were here. Why is that? And I remember the first time that I watched that movie and I sat, obviously it's a three hour long movie, but afterwards I sat on my little futon <laughs> and I sobbed for about an hour. Wow. Thinking about that one line, you know, because I've lost people and I love them more than I would, you know, it feels like more than I love them when they were here. But the reason being is because really at our core as human beings, all we want to be is connected. And I think our society understands that, but only wants to see the profit in that. So that's why social media exists because you can feel connected, but feel no love. And the, the difference between sharing space with somebody and like we were saying, heart space became this place where people just showed up full, whole, not nervous about this person or that person because we didn't know anybody, but we wanted to. We wanted to connect with people. And we found such authenticity in that. And I, I worry that we get so lost in this kind of superficial idea of connectivity that we lose the beauty of really deeply connecting with somebody in truth mm. and how that is a strength that literally transcends time space, you know, gravity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I am both by receiving what you said about that deep connectedness mm -hmm. and the thought that arrived is if there's a difference between maybe connection and exposure. <laughs> <laughs> exposure or proximity, right? Wow. Um, and I think perhaps maybe that is one of the, I don't want to call anything an illusion because, you know, people experience social media and each other in different ways, but mm. I feel perhaps in my life, what I have thought was connection was exposure to lots of people. Um, and a lot of people's exposure perhaps to me. And I wonder if connection is, the, the ways that connection can exist, is it a one way mm. thing? And how does connection change when it is mutual? Um, so, that's that's where, you know, as you were talking, I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. and what does that mean if we start to separate right. future versus connection? Hmm. That's yeah, that's real. That's so real. And and <laughs> again, as you were saying that, going back to this conversation of DEI, 
too often it's about well we can expose ourselves to this thing as you know nobody really wants to take the time and the work that is required to become connected with someone you know because if i if i'm connected to you i have to now understand your pains mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when i'm connected to you i have to understand what resources you don't have mm -hmm. and what i what i am able to give you you know mm -hmm. and people don't want to do that work mm -hmm. especially in in large large corporations it's it's not worthy it's not worthwhile to do that work when we can just have exposure and kind of get the same superficial praise. Ooh, so it, I don't know what about this conversation, but I'm like getting hit with images and things and words. Let's go, let's go. As you talk about connection mm -hmm. and exposure and sort of this ability to be in it. I don't, I don't know if it's being in it with someone, but being aware and receiving of the fact that someone is in mm -hmm. a place, even if it's different from yours. Right. I quite often think about my grandmother, um, who as the mother of the church, and I don't mm -hmm. know if it was her own calling or a, a calling that she felt was part of her um, position or role as the mother. Mm -hmm. but there was this very particular way that she was able to be with people mm, okay. um like when people died when people were sick she would just go from what i've heard she would just go to their houses to just sit with them mm. and she didn't necessarily do anything for them she would just be there right. and sit with them and acknowledge that they were having this experience of grief or sickness and that she was available with her presence. Hmm. And I think that to me, that seems like such a sort of different way of living to know that that kind of connection, that sitting with, that kind of sitting with someone yeah. is a form of connection and seeing and recognition. Hmm. And so when I think I, and that's my, I often see her as my guide of like, man, that's revolutionary to be like, I know you're having a hard time. I can't fix it. I'm just going to sit near you. You know, and, and these were people she didn't necessarily know. Right, right. Um, and so I think about when we talk about um, diversity, inclusion, connection, exposure, all of that, how there is often an unwillingness or maybe a lack of tools to be able to sit with, hmm. to sit with communities that you don't know, to be able to experience things that you may not be experiencing in your own life, in your own community, yeah. and, and to be with it and to receive it. And not with this idea that I'm gonna receive something in return, you know, just as this very human act of Care. Sure yeah. Yeah. And and I don't often see a willingness to just do that as a way of being. You know. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. oh, shout out, shout out to my grandma. But yeah, shout out to grandma. Seriously. You know, you know, but, but that's, I mean, that, that, that says so much about what community is, particularly for black folks. Right. It, it's the, it's the ways that we, I feel like have come up with to, to take care mm -hmm. of each other and both these small recognitions, like what's up? Oh, come on here. Right. Right. The way that, that, that's, that's an affirmation. That's a, I acknowledge your presence. Right. Yes. And that's, deep way of like, I'm going to sit with you in silence because I acknowledge this grief. Hmm. And so like, what, how does it change when we stop thinking about these fucking words? Right. 
Oh, I don't know if I can say that in short course. So maybe that's, <laughs> that's fine, I'm sure. <laughs> bleep it out. But um, <laughs> they have a really great sound, actually. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, instead of just like a... Um, right. What does it mean when we stop using terms that I think are maybe trademark or have some kind of um, recognition or, you know, and, and just think about it as becoming more human huh. or becoming more connected or healing with others. I think when I think of it that way, and because I think of it that way, it's not, there's no way that it can be a short term experience right. or an exchange. Um, and I'm recovering the humanity that's consistently requested to sort of be obsolete uh -huh. in our relation to each other. Yeah. Amen and amen. I don't know why I'm like talking very like with such. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps because it's been so long since we talked. I just feel like I just I do want to connect. And, you know, this is <laughs> the reason why this is on my mind so heavily. Mm -hmm. It's very random, but I feel like random stuff be preaching to me. No. So I will admit that. Bela, uh, you know, and I have watched a lot of cooking shows together. Mm -hmm. And my family likes watching, you know, different cooking experiences. And so they introduced me to Gordon Ramsay's Uncharted. Yeah. Where he just be traveling around, whatever. <laughs> um, doing what he does. But I, there were some of the communities in the show that lived in that from what I saw lived in such connection hmm. to the land um, that it really, even watching it opened me up and really blew me away at the, the type of reverence that comes with that deep connection and it's not taking anything for granted. Like, you know, the food when you have to literally climb the mountain to go get it. Right. Right, and and the kind of sort of prayers and gratitude that was being expressed because it was all part of this one organism, and I I was really I, I think it was such a contrast to the way that we even experience food mm -hmm. um, in our country that I've just been thinking about like the meaning of connectedness and the meaning of reverence and how reverence is a could maybe be a lot more incorporated when we see the process, when we can see the seed of things, and we can see the fruition of mm. things because it impacts us. And when we share that land and space yeah. and air, so yeah. that's that's really where all this is coming from. Is you know, Uncharted. <laughs> 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 yeah. There was there are really some great episodes, and I'm like. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Who knew this would be a sermon? <laughs> Listen, no, that's real. And I mean, and when we talk about, even when we talk about things like appropriation versus appreciation, that's exactly what that is. It's understanding rev the reverence, what it means to literally revere um, the process of being connected to something. And I think in communities like you may be seeing on this show, it starts so young. It starts so early. And I guess I, maybe I don't mean young even as an age. I just mean like the, the idea is so, Present. Here. Fundamental. yeah. And, and again, it, it goes back to that thing. It's not an afterthought. It's not the thing that we need to add to make something cool. Mm -hmm. It's just, the the thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yes exactly that and and if we can start revering and understanding or taking time to revere the 
the process by which things happen, by which people are made, we would have a much easier time holding space for people, mm. you know? Mm. We, we wouldn't even need to, we wouldn't even have to hold space for anyone. It would just be there because we recognize that we need them. Mm -hmm. And that we're just all, like you said, the origin of things, and I'm thinking about constellations, how we're all like these constellations of the universe of our own histories of the space and time that we're in. I mean, it's really magical. I was preached again, and another sermon I received was actually while doing my child's hair. Mm -hmm. And this idea that black hair is this thing that has to be tamed. Mm. And um, for many of us, it is a source of trauma Right. Because people are not being, we are not being equipped. We are robbed of the tools to care for the particular ways that it grows out. And so it's really framed as this, this problem and hair can be this sort of war zone, right? Right, right. Um, and I think about what it means to really pull things from the root, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're, when we're not taking care of our hair as kids, we have these things that pull from the root, yeah. sometimes permanently and what kind of harm that does and what does it mean when your early some of your earliest experiences of your body are it being sort of traumatized wow um as part of being on the planet right mm -hmm. um and what we learn to expect when we get our hair done pain um and so i'm thinking about this as i'm going through my child's mm -hmm. hair and I'm looking at the curls and how their hair is not my hair, their hair is my hair and my line and their father's line mm. and how much it changes when I, when we transform this relationship as one of conflict, mm. one of making it be something versus, and I like, you know, was wedding it and I just really gently took the time right. to revere it and very gently moved my fingers through each piece of hair yeah. and how I wish that we could experience that. So many children could experience that. Black children particularly can experience yeah. that kind of tenderness toward their hair. Right. And when we expand that, 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 that tenderness and reverence that this hair is your history, this hair is your literal genetic history and also this reverence that could then expand to us as people mm -hmm. and our bodies and who we are. It's not these places of conflict and not places to be tamed and controlled and flattened out and straightened and burned. <laughs> Right, Ooh. places for reverence and this awe and finding the tools to be more tender and to allow it to be itself. Yeah, like you you preaching real good right now, <laughs> and I really I really look. I don't even know if we're recording anymore, but look, <laughs> somebody better get this mess because. <laughs> Yes, if we could only find the tools to be tender, as opposed to trying to straighten and yank and clear out and separate and, and tug uproot. on and uproot the things that are literally our genetic code, our genetic history. You better bring it around, Yelly. You better bring it around, okay? <laughs> wow. Woo, man. Come on. That's so real. That's so, and there are too many Black children who, like you said, who experience that trauma so young, not even realizing the impact that that's going to have on them, have on them for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Their first experience of, of of 
working with their genetic makeup is trauma. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. first, the first time I get to touch and feel my, you know, what makes me me happens after trauma. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no, we can't, we can, we cannot let this go on for too much longer. Well, and the sense trauma, but also the sense of wrongness. Yes. This innate wrongness. Mm. And and not just wrongness without context. Right. Wrong in relation to those that are right. Things that are right. I mean, there's so many layers of it. Because not only that, but you're also teaching this child that if they're not capable of doing, of, of untangling, of uprooting, of straightening, of separate, if they are not capable of doing those things, then they will not be capable of being presentable to the world. So and, from, and unworthy of being seen, right? Ooh, Yelly, my God. That's that's really hitting me. That's really hitting me hard right now. I mean, I grew up in a household full of black women and I would watch my mom, my aunt, my grandma get their hair done. And like, it would be such this, a, a beautiful process. But I remember when my sister got old enough where she started like doing specific things to her hair. I remember my mom saying, you don't need to cut your hair. You don't need to get a perm. What do you want to do with your hair? And I remember thinking like, are you really giving her a choice right now? <laughs> but how beautiful that moment must have been for my sister to decide for herself what she could do with her hair and for it not to have been this kind of like, you must do it or else. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure she still received that through other facets of society. But to be given the choice at a young age to say, this is how I want to show up to the world. That's so important. That's so important. And too many people have been stripped from that choice right out of the womb. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is what we need to understand. That is what we need to like really revere and, and, and understand about our world is that we are taking choices away from people yeah. before they can even make the choice. Mm -hmm. or, is, or even aware that there's a choice to be made. And then you throw it back in their face 20 years later by saying, well, you should, and you should have, and maybe if you, and why don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We blame the person and not the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's good. That's real good. That's real good. That's, that is real good. <laughs> Look, I'm, I have chills. I'm like, oh, wow. Mm. I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my child probably thought I was high or something <laughs> because this this entire sort of download is coming to me as I'm doing your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Promise you, like, I have like you know my fingers are mid tangle, <laughs> and you know I'm like you know I I start to pull very thinly, and then I'm like. And then I'm staring at the curl and the color with my mouth open. And then I like, go dry my hands and I scribble something, you know, on this closet. That's literally everything over here. <laughs> and so I did that literally 10 times while just trying to like comb their hair out on a, you know, on a Friday morning. But um, <laughs> I just, I, I, one more like thing that I'd like to share, because this is the first time that I talked about it. Mm -hmm. There was this sort of exquisite moment. So their hair has been, my doing of their hair has, has really been a source of 
uh, frustration for both of us. They don't like having their hair touched. However, I'm like, there are things that you have to do to keep your hair healthy um, in, in some sense, right? Uh, and so ever since they were kids, it's been like, oh, you gotta wash my hair. <laughs> and I would try to be as gentle as possible. And so I came to the like place where I knew, I'm like, it's about to pop off, okay? Mm -hmm. The middle of their scalp is really sensitive. And in the past, I've gone extremely gently and tried to like pull the, and they'll be like, oh! and like, let me do it, you know? I and love being, them. And I'm being gentle, I'm being so gentle, like, like feather, like, oh, yes. delicate. And then they would take it and just be like, oh, and they would like rip it very rough. And I'm like, wait, like, how does it hurt real bad? When I am gentle, but you are over here ripping these sides out with no feeling. And so, because I'm in the middle of this downvote, this like very spiritual moment about history and uh -huh. <laughs> consent and everything, I got to that area. And I took a deep breath and I said, can you show me how to do this? Hmm. And I said, "If actually, do you, do you want to do this part? Hmm. And it was like, it's small, but it was this not acknowledgement that my idea of what their pain is or how they perceive things doesn't make it true. Like to allow them to have their own experience. And there are things that I'm not gonna be able to do. So I handed it over and they said very gently, mom, it hurts because you do it like this. And the way I do it is I pull it apart this way. And they showed me, and after that point, I was able to just comb through the rest of their hair. And there was no, for the first time in 11 years almost, there was no strain and how beautiful it was to have this connection of like, this is yours. This is not actually my experience, it's actually your experience. And and I, I just thought about like, what it means to, to grant children that ability to not have to hold in pain. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time, I wasn't, that was also the first time that they could say, ah, and I didn't ignore it as part of the process. Cause we were often told we'll be, ah, 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 and our parents almost didn't hear it. And because I was in such a, this place of sensitivity and reverence, when they went, ow, it hurt. It actually hurt me. Um, versus being a sound that I'm supposed to ignore. Wow. And it's a pain that they're supposed to experience. And so I was really shocked. I was like, oh, what is, what is happening when we show sh children that you're not supposed to experience pain? And if you're experiencing pain, something is not being addressed with perhaps the kind of tenderness that you deserve or the time. It just takes time. You don't have to rip knots. You sometimes have to really uh -huh. be intentional and careful and loving. So that's what's been up for me just about connection and history and tenderness. Um, yeah. You are, you are helping, man. You just don't even know. I, whoo, that is so powerful. That is so powerful. Not only for, you know, the conversation that we were having before about, you know, taking care with communities that you don't have, you know, the knowledge of or the experience of taking care with them, but it's so important for us right now it's so important for black folk to hear that pain needs to be addressed and it doesn't have to be addressed with force it can be addressed with tenderness and tenderness might look like time oh that that's good yelly that's so good. Tenderness might look like time. Mm. It might look like changing the method by which you do 
the thing that you're trying to get done. Mm -hmm. But it needs, to, it has to be addressed yeah. because if, if oh, wow, I'm, there's so much in what you said. I mean, the idea that when you hear ow from Bela, you're hurt because, wait, why, no, that, what, no, let me address this pain, you know, as opposed to when you hear ow, ignoring it because you feel like that's something that they're supposed to just, oh my God, do you know how, there are so many levels. And that tells you, I mean, and, and going back to what we were talking about, that connectedness, it brings me back to my humanity because what does it take to hear someone in pain and to not acknowledge it? Ooh. Or to tell yourself that it is not pain, it is learning. Mm. And so I felt like in that moment, I recovered some deep peace of my own humanity that perhaps just was buried when I would get my hair done and combs would break and things would hurt, that, you know, my hair was literally pulled out. Mm. I had to learn to, pulled out from the roots, I had to learn to ignore my own pain and my pain was ignored. And to have this moment where that ow wasn't ignored, it caused a sensation in my body that hurt. Um, it was, I could feel it. I said something just shifted in, in my ability to be, um, connected. Ooh. That, that, that. So I imagine just, you know, my, I feel like my life practice my daily practice you know i don't want to say that this is the way that i'm supposed to relate to everything all the time right there's all there's a balance there's conversation there's so much but what might it feel like to allow for these kind of openings and that kind of sen sensitivity to what to the way that i interact with myself in my own pain and the pain mm -hmm. that I think i'm supposed to not say out to or the pain that I believe that is not supposed to be addressed. Right. And how healing that shifts, you know, the relationships to like organisms and other communities yeah. and people. And it's it's really sitting with me deeply. And 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 what I now think about when people say they want to be connected to me. Wow. Yelly, you've you have preached and really given me so much to take and apply, especially that last bit. What does it mean when people want to be connected to you? Ooh, yeah, that, mm -hmm. when someone says they want to be connected with you through friendship, through relationship, through acquaintanceship, whatever, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And what is my response? And what does it mean? to expect reverence and not in the sense of awe, but in the sense of respecting and holding the delicateness that we are all entitled to. Mm. Yes. I'm gonna take a deep breath.
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for talking with me. I mean, story core aside, this this is so I mean, you are always right on time. Mm -hmm. Your spirit is always right on time. Your experiences are right on time. And somehow or another, we always speak to each other through our experiences and what we take away from them. And it's so invaluable. It's so invaluable. So thank you for sharing that experience with me because there's so much to take away from that. I'm ready to hop on the phone with my auntie and be like, look, when you doing so-and-so's hair. Take your time. Be tender. Ugh. Be tender. And I'm also ready to call these organizations who are like, we want to be connected with so-and-so community and we want to do engagement and we want to be tender. Mm. Know what you're asking for when you say you want to be connected to someone or be ready to receive authentically. Because when, when that community says, ow, you can't decide to ignore that because you asked to be connected. Mm -hmm. Girl, <laughs> May the Lord watch between exactly. two <laughs> well, while we have to, but not one, really. come on. Prince <laughs> now and forevermore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we thank you. Like that's it. That's my heart needed this conversation. Mine too. Mine too, really. I so needed this. Mm. And this is why you are in my life. This is why you ain't going nowhere. So I hope, no you're, ready. I hope you're ready for this journey. We are in it for lives. Period. <laughs> Period. Uh, well, I mean, to be continued. To be continued, truly. This is... This is one of those heart space conversations. It is. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to heart space. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time. Like I said, I don't know what has been recorded, but honestly, it feels it feels authentic. It feels like our usual connection. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you for taking time to be public about that. I am grateful. So we will we will keep going, and um, I feel like this is a beautiful, beautiful place to close, right? I think so. All right. So all right. Well, I'm gonna press stop. <laughs>